Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to this special five-part podcast series sponsored by Affiliated Monitors, which celebrates Affiliated Monitors' 15 years in business as the first entity specializing in independent integrity monitoring. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides independent integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in nearly 750 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance programs, visit this podcast series sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. In this five-part series, I visit with Jerry Coyne. Jerry is the Managing Director of State Monitoring Services at Affiliated Monitors. We consider the use of monitors by state attorneys general. In part one, we take a look at the role of state AGs as enforcer. In part two, the reaction to the big tobacco settlement and criticism of state attorneys general. Part three, the multi-state settlements in the post-tobacco era. Part four, challenges of multi-state litigation today. And part five, we take a look at the road ahead. It's a fascinating series. I know you will enjoy it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. In this episode two, we take a look at the reaction to the big tobacco settlement by the state attorney generals and criticism of some of the roles and efforts they had in that initiative. This special five-part series is a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode in our five-part exploration of the use of monitors by state attorney generals. I'm joined again by Jerry Coyne, the Managing Director, State Monitoring Operations at Affiliated Monitors. Jerry, first of all, uh, welcome back. Thank you. Jerry, we ended yesterday's episode uh, with a little highlight or teaser for today's episode, and it was around the settlement, the master settlement in the big tobacco litigation. So uh, today I wanted to explore the reaction to that settlement and perhaps some criticisms of attorneys general uh, in that settlement and, and see where that might take us. But um, uh, as I recall from, from my uh, reading and studying the matter, uh, this was a huge deal back in the late 90s. Certainly in the state of Texas, it was a very large, uh, significant piece of litigation and it seemed to me to, bear, to bring some significant dollars to literally every state across the country. Tommy, it wasn't just significant dollars. It was an unprecedented amount of money. And one of the unique things about it was that the money was not just going to come in a lump sum. It was an income stream that would go on in perpetuity to the states. And that was something that um, certainly in terms of resolving litigation of this type had never occurred before. Um, more significantly for the states and particularly for the governors and the state legislatures around the country, it was money that came to the states with no strings attached. So some states, um, and I know, for example, West Virginia was one of them that were very proud of the fact that they had directed large amounts of the money to the what they call the cause of the problem, public health. Many states used that money to balance their state budget, to pave the roads, to fund schools and do all the other things that state budgets typically do. So that um, was a great appeal to uh, state legislatures and governors and put shockwaves across a lot of industries and businesses. Sitting from from your perspective, and, and maybe now actually 20 years later, what were some of the lessons learned that, uh, that you saw and you have seen since that time, Jerry? Well, I think there was a, a number of them. And the first was that, as I said, Everybody out there was wondering who was going to be the next industry, because if the attorney generals, the, the theory was at least if the attorney generals could take on tobacco and they were supposedly the strongest group out there, then they could really take on anybody. So there was a lot of people that spent a lot of time just speculating about what would be the next business. And that caused a number of people in the business community um, to begin to criticize and in some cases, rightfully so, 
some of what had gone on in the tobacco case, the, the first level of criticism and one of the ones that was played out very publicly was that most states, in fact, I think every state had hired outside counsel to supplement the attorney general's office. And those outside counsel were paid by contingent fee agreements, meaning that they would get a percentage of whatever money they brought back to the states. Back to litigation, when you talk about the enormous amounts of money we've been talking about, the attorney's fees were just unprecedented. They were huge and unprecedented. Jerry, I recall that was a hugely controversial issue in the state of Texas. And as I recall, there were over $3 billion uh, in attorney's fees, uh, contingent attorney's fees, paid out to private attorneys here in um, just in the state of Texas alone. So I know uh, of that controversy. And um, how did uh, the attorneys generals, uh, was there a uniform reaction or what did it really vary literally from state to state? Well, it varied from state to state, Tom, and some states um, really cracked down on the attorneys general's ability to hire outside counsel. There was a perception um, probably more than reality, but the perception was that the attorneys general had, in some cases, hired friends and political supporters. But in every case, the attorney generals hired these outside counsels because they simply lacked the resources to take on this type of national litigation. The biggest reaction to it was probably a tightening of the process by which you could hire in the future. But no state, um, despite a lot of protests by the business community and others prevented attorneys general from doing that in the future. Everybody recognized that uh, this was a necessity. It's just that those fees caused enormous backlash. Jerry, you talked about this in our first episode is really uh, a game changer, maybe even ground zero for the attorney generals changing uh, how they think about these types of issues uh, going forward. But you touched on how the states use the payments as broadly as uh, down to the original cause to, to paving roads. Uh, would you say that um, this uh, this part of the process, the payments to the states and how the state used the money, uh, had as large a controversy as the contingent fee payments to the uh, private law firms, or was this uh, perhaps not not as a bigger problem? I, I think Tom, it was perhaps not as visibly played out but it was as big of a problem. Um, I think that among the industry groups and the business groups, the concern was that with unrestricted money coming to the states, then any any business or any um, potential target out there could be viewed as a deep pocket. And so what the industries started to do was to try to take and ensure that monies um, brought in in future settlements were more targeted to the cause of the problem. So that um, if it was a tobacco, a public health case, the monies would go to public health and that would hopefully take away some of this incentive to just find the next target um, who could help balance state budgets. That was at least the perception. But that became a very, very... um, active issue in terms of uh, kind of a behind-the-scenes issue. So, Jerry, in every litigation, there's obviously at least two parties, and we've talked about one of the parties extensively in these two podcasts, but the other party was the tobacco industry. From your perspective, what did you see as the result uh, or the impact, rather, on the tobacco industry? Well, um, the big impact was they didn't go away. Um, there was a, I think, a lot of people out there who were public health advocates and people who had long um, been involved in the criticism of the tobacco industry were kind of disappointed when the litigation ended because they thought this was an opportunity to maybe put big tobacco out of business, and that didn't happen. And what emerged after the settlement agreement was this perpetual flow of money um, that was going to come to the states was going to come from the tobacco industry. So in many people's eyes, there was a thought that perhaps the states had kind of made a little bit of a deal with the devil here, that the continued existence of the tobacco um, industry, you know, mind you, with much greater restrictions on it than ever before and hopefully a different targeted audience was still going to exist and that the 
the states had agreed um, through the master settlement agreement to protect the market share of the settling defendants because of all these restrictions they had put on them. Part of the agreement was that the states would enforce those rules against all the other tobacco companies to make sure that others didn't come in and take advantage of not being um, settling defendants. So it really was, uh, it changed that landscape dramatically. Jerry, that really leads into next, the final area I wanted to explore with you, and you really hit it on the head, which is the enforcement challenge. Um, when you're in litigation, uh, it's certainly um, uh, adversarial, uh, but then when you move to settlement, it can be l- perhaps either less adversarial or even collaborative, where you agree to some joint resolution, which would require action by both parties, uh, which you just articulated the actions, uh, some of the actions that the uh, states would have to engage in. And how how did that uh, really increase the enforcement challenge going forward? Well, in, in the case of tobacco, Tom, what they the states agreed to through the master settlement agreement was to diligently enforce the agreement. And that became a, a phrase that the states probably have come to regret because through that pledge to diligently enforce, there was a fairly complex process that was written in, whereas if a state failed to diligently enforce the agreement, the future payments could be reduced or even eliminated. The states agreed to do was to make sure that non-participating manufacturers didn't get a market share advantage against those who had participated. Obviously, the tobacco companies couldn't enforce the agreement, so the enforcement mechanism and the obligation to enforce really fell square on the states. And to do that, most states needed to increase the number of resources dramatically in terms of their tobacco enforcement, not only in the attorney general's offices, but also in places like revenue departments, taxation departments, state police that would be involved in enforcing tobacco laws to make sure that, for example, taxes are paid, to make sure that um, interstate transportation of tobacco is uh, regulated. And that was an entire regulatory structure that grew exponentially coming out of this agreement. So, Jerry, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time, but uh, I've been visiting with uh, Jerry Coyne today. Uh, the Managing Director for State Monitoring Operations at Affiliated Monitors. I hope you'll join us tomorrow where we take up multi-state settlements in the post-tobacco era. Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of our five-part exploration of the use of monitors by state's attorneys general. If you need more information, check out the Affiliated Monitor website, www.affiliatedmonitors.com. I hope you'll join us again for another episode in this uh, fascinating five-part series. I know you will enjoy it. This special five-part podcast series on the use of monitors by state's attorneys generals is a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network.